more things change, the more they stay the same in some respects. E3 is dead and gone. Long live the Summer Games Fest. As well, E3 has taken the place of what had been E3. It's, it's taken its spot in the calendar. It's taken the concept of a closed to the public and only accessible to the media um, event for people to come in and uh, try out video games and um, for press to preview games and that sort of thing. Um, it has bit the same spot in terms of creating a central hub for game to, for game companies to release trailers or um, showcases and for um, people to schedule for get for trailers, schedule appointments for game with game developers and publishers which are not necessarily directly related to summer games fest itself um, in a way it's perhaps become it is commercial, but it's less commercial in a way than what E3 was in the past and in its peak and certainly where it is at, almost at, and where we're at for Nintendo Power Retrospectives in terms of, I mean, yes, we're at this point, Nintendo Power Retrospectives, E3 is still, is still in Atlanta and hasn't moved back to Los Angeles yet, but the point still stands um, that it's not that E3 was like Consumer Electronics Show meant to serve as something of Yes, the consumers can go in and see gadgets and that sort of thing, but also meant to be a place for retailers, conventional brick and mortar retail, to have face time with and hands on time with games and game consoles and that sort of thing. And we don't really have that same structure anymore. Um, even for our physical game peripherals and that sort of thing. Oftentimes, those are going to go direct to consumers, and then if it does well with consumers, then what independent brick-and-mortar game retail there is will follow up to stock these products, and that's that sort of thing. Once a retailer and a manufacturer, or once a manufacturer has established themselves and built a reputation. So, with Summer Games Fest, we have put our focus in on the actual games themselves and the people getting the word out about them. Because if you're going to be buying them, you're going to be buying them through a digital storefront like Steam or GOG or Epic or H.io or that sort of thing. If we do get a physical release for any of these, or of course, consoles. Um, and if we do get a physical release for any of these, they will, if it's not a AAA title or not from a AAA publisher, then it's going to be through a boutique publisher like I Am 8-Bit or some different games or that sort of thing so it makes sense for us to focus on to, 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 to put the focus on interaction with the press so with summer games fest um because of this i am actually going to be focusing a bit more this time on independent titles not not because there weren't any triple a titles that not, that grabbed my interest or there were but a lot of them were ones that I'd heard of before, and the independent ones were the ones that were relatively new to me. Um, so I'm not going to be focusing mainly on games that I have not seen previous to this Summer Games Fest, or as it says, that weren't covered from the previous Summer Games Fest. Um, some of them may have, but I might have missed them. Uh, they're on a showcase I didn't watch, or that sort of thing. And I'm going to put myself to about five. With the honorable mention of Citizen Sleeper 2, as of this recording, I have finished playing through Citizen Sleeper 1 and enjoyed it. And I'm going to pick up Citizen Sleeper 2. It's so I'm already I'm already looking out for that. So that, that's a moot point. First off is Squeak Ross, which is meant to be um which is a little bit of Animal Crossing and a little bit of Picross, where you are doing nanogram puzzles to create furniture for your rodent friend's home. I like Picross. I've enjoyed seeing other takes on this concept, like with Murder by Numbers. So I'm itched to see how this works in a Animal Crossing concept. It's a pretty self-explanatory idea. And I think it works out fairly well. Next up is, on, a, on my list, we have Alzara. This is one of a couple of 
Jap of um our turn-based three turn-based RPGs that we've had inspired by Japanese role-playing games, um, like Dragon Quest and Chrono Trigger. Um Alzara Radiant Echoes has several compo as a composer um from with experience in music from Japanese RPGs involved. I'm just they're kind of pulling stuff back up here. Um Otoi Sakuraba, uh, who worked on uh Golden Sun, which I enjoyed. And also uh Nushiro Ambe working on character design, but with the environments being much more Mediterranean focused. Um and with the studio in question, Studio Camellia being from French. In fact, this is kind of one of the things that came out of this, outside from the return of or resurgence of the possession based game is i guess we'd call the the french the francophone rpg um i almost call it the generation albator rpg in the sense of when you there is a generation of bond disney creators and um other similar artists who got their who were influenced by japanese animation that made it to french television or um in um spurring on their own works and were seeing a similar thing here um with this title where it's again is very mediterranean themed um in terms of its environments and i am looking to i look forward to see how this pans out next on the list is um claire obscure uh expedition 33 another turn-based role-playing game from a french developer this one again looks interesting it's more realistic in its visual tone it has it's not entirely clear what the backstory of the game itself is um i'm pulling stuff up as i discuss this so trying not to blast music onto the um deal with the antagonist called the paintress with um and again, the the, the, the turn based again turn based combat system very inspired by Japanese role playing games, and looks like with a very strong character focus to go with this, which I dig. I like my role playing games, console or uh, otherwise, do have a strong character focus to them. Like Baldur's Gate for this, uh, the Baldur's Gate series, the Pillars of Eternity. Same same thing applies here. Uh, Sacri uh, Sacrifier, which is another one from Sakuraba, who's been very busy. Um, this is from Studio Pixelated Milk. Uh, also, he worked on, uh, mentioned Sakuraba, also worked on the Star Ocean series. Um, again, similar sort of setup. Uh, strategy using, using a mix of real-time and turn-based combat. Um, from what I recall hearing about it in some of the podcasts where people got a little bit of hands-on time to it. It looks like um, the way it's set up is that the uh, it, it can toggle between real time and turn based combat dependent on the difficulty of the situation. Like random mobs you can roll over in a heartbeat, you can just deal with them in real time. And then when you need to get more strategic and tactical, you can switch, you can go to a turn based mode. Uh, it's also going to doing something of a, a 2.5D vibe or HD 2D vibe, which I also, I, I really dig that art style and I've liked it in Octopath Traveler. I've liked it in, um, the, in, um, what I saw of the Dragon Quest three remaster, uh, remake. So that looks great. I'm digging that there. Um, and finally on my list of my top five is UFO 50. UFO 50 is a collection of 50 games for fictitious console system, um, all inspired by and meant to be designed to fit the limitations of what would have been available for like the 8-bit console generation graphics, which reminds me a lot of a game called, um, oh, uh, not game. reminds me of the Game Center CX retro game challenge game on the, on the Nintendo DS. This is a game which had a bunch of fictitious games within it, inspired by titles that were featured on Game Center CX, and meant to focus on various eras of game and how of uh, of uh, game design, 
through the 8-bit to 16-bit era and how game design would evolve and also with it how like within the game series how it would the game series itself would evolve even within the same console generation as other works would influence each other and i'm really excited to see how this works with um, ufo 50 it looks like it's gonna be on that vibe they might be tr i hope that they get into somewhat with with the with the narrative of this fictional console like it would be wonderful if they went like full atari 50 for a console that didn't exist if it went um maybe not even full atari 50 but like where it had concept where you have unlockable concept art where you'd have fictional strategy guide articles that you'd unlock as you play through the game from um various magazines um fictional reviews from not Electronic Gaming Monthly and not Game Pro and um, that sort of thing. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing like how this is not just the games themselves. The games themselves look great, but how the larger narrative presentation around this is and that structure. As someone who was, if you if you hadn't figured out from following this channel, um, who was passionate about game history, seeing game history represented and reinterpreted in this way sounds exciting and i look forward to seeing more um so those are the five indie titles that grabbed my interest from summer game fest what else caught your interest what other indie titles um have struck your fancy have you that you've added to your steam wish list and you're looking forward to playing on your switch or your ps5 or xbox or um PC or Steam or Steam Deck. Is there a game which is like, um, this is like this is like the perfect Steam Deck game for me. I'm interested to in hearing that. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.